Several years ago, there was a trend among certain Christians asking the question, what would Jesus do? They made bumper stickers and t-shirts and coffee mugs, all with the letters WWJD, what would Jesus do? It was a simplistic question, but maybe it got some people to think about their actions before stepping forward. I want to ask a similarly simplistic question, but a different question. What does Jesus want? Now, in asking that question, I am not suggesting that I understand the mind of Jesus or knew what he was really like in the first century and what things he preferred. But I am thinking about the gospel narratives, the stories we have handed down, that give us insight into what Jesus thought was important. And based on those, I'm asking the question, what does Jesus want? As I explore this question, I want to invite you to subscribe to this channel as well as to click the bell so you're notified of future videos. So, you know, if you go into any Christian church, one of the things you'll probably notice is a lot of language, well, a lot of singing about praise, praising Jesus, praising God. And, you know, if it's a traditional kind of church, they sing hymns like praise God from whom all blessings flow or praise God the Almighty. If it's a, a more contemporary or evangelical church, they sing praise choruses or even have rock bands that sing about praising Jesus. Does Jesus want to be praised? Is that something that he asked for? You know, we don't find it anywhere in the Gospels. Jesus doesn't ask to be praised. He didn't seek out attention. He was a pretty humble guy who went about his life speaking honestly and truthfully. I don't think he was insecure. I don't think he needed to be told about all the great things he had done. Nor do I think he's somehow codependent and needs to be reminded of his greatness because he just doesn't know and wants adulation. I think Jesus was a secure guy. I don't think he needed the praise of others. He did things out of a conviction, a moral conviction of what was right. And I think that's important for us to remember. And, you know, the other thing that I find very odd is this whole thing about having a personal relationship with Jesus. That's nowhere to be found in the Gospels. None of the, Jesus doesn't say that anywhere. None of the gospel writers suggest that. In fact, there are stories that would make this seem sort of a little bit crazy. You know, like feeding 5,000 people. Jesus wasn't concerned about having a personal relationship with those 5,000 people. He was concerned about getting them fed. He wanted them to learn the lessons he was teaching. It wasn't about having a personal relationship. He was continually inviting people to follow the way he was teaching. What Jesus wants is followers to his teaching. And what is his teaching? What was really important? Love one another as I have loved you. By this will they know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. Love those who hate you. Good, do good to those who persecute you. Make love your aim. That's central to the focus of Jesus, to the teaching of Jesus, to the person of Jesus. What Jesus wants most, more than anything else, is for us to love and care and respect each other. And that's difficult because it isn't just liking those who like us. It's going further and loving our enemies, doing good for those who hate us, recognizing that they are all children of God, that we are all in this together and connected. So Jesus calls us to love, and he calls us to express that love in tangible ways. Luke records that he began his ministry saying that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to release to captives, and to do something positive in the world. That's what he's really saying, to do things. At the end of the Gospel in Matthew, he says how we're going to be 
in effect judged, were we followers or not? And the measure for that is what we did to the least, to the others. Did we feed the hungry? Did we give a drink to those who were thirsty? Did we visit those who were in prison? Did we welcome in strangers? Did we do things that made people's lives better? You know, the people Jesus spent time with, where he invested his time, were the people on the fringes, the people no one else wanted to be with. In fact, he tells a story about the realm of God being like a banquet. And when the people who were first invited didn't show up, the head of the banquet said, bring in everybody, invite everyone to come in. Everyone was welcome. It wasn't just the popular people. It wasn't the people with power and prestige. It was everybody. Jesus wants his followers to be loving and to do things in the world that make the world a better place. Make it a better place for people's real lives. And he said, by this you'll know that you're my disciples, that you have love for one another, and you'll know them by their fruit. You see, the impact of life, do we bring out love in life? Do we bring out goodness in life? The fruit of our efforts, that's what's important. You know, if you really follow the teachings of Jesus, it's not gonna bring power, prestige, money, or anything else. It's probably gonna put you at risk, risk of ridicule, risk of a reputation. People aren't gonna like it because you're not always gonna take their side. But following Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the real teachings of Jesus, are life-giving for ourselves and for other people. I have to wonder, could it be that because the teachings of Jesus are so difficult, that they don't lead to power, prestige, and money, that institutional religion has never been able to embrace them? Something to worth to think about. Be sure to subscribe to this channel, like the video, share it with others, leave me some comments, and know that I appreciate the time you spend today in spirituality beyond borders. Thank you.